uh, one uh, one of the things that we wanted to uh, you know share with you before uh, before the actual topic starts was you know more of uh, an awareness for all our customers and um, uh, i'm sure many of you have heard about uh, the program called ask an expert uh, so this is uh, uh, this is uh, this is a a uh, feature or a functionality that is available for our premium and uh, signature sets of customers, uh, wherein you can request for a dedicated time with our subject matter experts, right? Uh, it's a unique channel uh, for you guys to engage uh, uh, with, uh, with the support uh, uh, team members uh, for a 45 minute dedicated session. This is available uh, twice a month so you can uh, you can actually uh, book it a uh, book a uh, session twice in a month so it's uh, it's available on the same e support portal where you go and open cases uh, you have an option called as ask an expert we have uh, over 350 slots uh, available across uh, time zones uh, that is supported and uh, you you have an option to block a session 5 days in advance so the five days is just to ensure that we have enough time to prepare, uh, uh, prepare for the session, and you know to set the agenda and make sure you know uh, the, the the subject matter experts uh, sort of uh, prepare uh, uh, prepare the presentations and and deliver it. So the topics of engagement uh, it could include best practices, it could include new features and functionalities, you know, in a product. And uh, it could also include uh, any uh, you know, upcoming release uh, uh, information as well. And the product uh, and the product that are uh, products that are supported for Ask an Expert uh, are uh, Big Data, uh, IICS, uh, Power Center, Data Quality, MDM, and EDC. I think. Uh, we very recently uh, uh, started uh, supporting Axon as well. So these are the uh, different products that are supported. So I would uh, highly encourage uh, uh, all you guys to sort of you know go and uh, use this uh, uh, use this feature that's available for our customers. It's been a big hit, uh, very very popular. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vipin and uh, Ramesh uh, for their presentation. Thank you, Pradabi. Um, Pradabi, you have the control? Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, myself, Ramesh, and I have with me Vipin. Uh, both of us are the presenter for this session. Uh, welcome to the session, and thanks for joining. So the agenda of this presentation uh, is uh, as below. Uh, we start with the Spark architecture, and in which we are specifically talking about how the BDM integrates with the Spark engine, and then we talk about um, how the resource allocation being handled within a Spark. What is the Spark software service? Um, next, we move on and see how the journey from Spark Blaze to Spark uh, being uh, with Informatica BDM product, and then I'll have Vipin take over and continue on the troubleshooting spark monitoring uh, and talk about important BDM article uh, details and then we'll take a QA. and a So with that said, um, let's get started. So on the Spark architecture, uh, what I'm going to cover here is how a BDM mapping, uh, when you run in a Spark engine, gets uh, converted into a Spark job and then get submitted to the cluster. It goes through multiple stages in between. Um, so uh, the first stage is the translation stage. If you see here, um, you have a, typically you will have a mapping with source for some transformation and target. Here, this is very simplistic, which has a source and target. What happens is in the translation phase, each of the transformation source or let's say if you have any transformation expression rank or any other transformation and target. At the end of the day, these all are uh, it's Informatica transformations. And so what happens in the translation phase is all these trans Informatica transformations are get converted into uh, Spark equivalent using uh, Informatica proprietary translators. 
Uh, so we have uh, translators for each type of source. Suppose if you have a Hive source, we have a Hive translator. If you have the relational sources, uh, Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, then those get converted uh, into a scoop uh, type of uh, job. So we have a scoop translator and so on for different transformation type. We have a translator that translates into a Spark equivalent. And that is what uh, we call it as a translation phase. Uh, once the translation is complete, uh, then we do a merge state. So the merge state is basically to optimize and push down whatever the logic can be pushed into one Spark job, and uh, and, and 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 then we uh, kind of optimize the entire mapping flow into multiple Spark jobs. So that's where the optimization happens in the merge state. And then once the merge is complete, um, there is something. Then we move on to the rendering stage. In the rendering stage, what happens is your the output from your merge state is actually being converted into a Scala code, um, and once this and, and gets written as a Java file. So once we have a code a Scala code output, then uh, uh, we do a compilation and prepare it as an application uh, uh, as a jar file, uh, which gets uh, submitted to the cluster using a Spark submit. So these are the internal stages that it goes through when you run any mapping. Uh, in Spark Engine before it gets submitted to the cluster. Uh, these are the stages that it goes through. It's very internal. This, everything is being done within Informatica. And most of the time, you may not have to go through, but just to kind of know the basics, uh, these are the stages that it goes through before actually mapping gets translated into a Scala code to be run on the cluster. So um, here, uh, here, this is the high level picture. Uh, we talked about how a mapping gets converted into a Spark program, but but this is kind of a bigger picture. Uh, you see left hand side we have Informatica domain, right hand side we have a Hadoop cluster. So when you submit any mapping to the DIS, DIS has a thread called um, LDTM, Logical Data Transformation Manager. This process, this stage uh, is what actually does all the steps that I just talked about in the previous slide about uh, translating a mapping to a uh, an application to be submitted as a Spark job. That this LDTM is what every, uh, being uh, the all the stages is being executed by the LDTM uh, thread. Once we have an application package with a jar, then we contact a Spark engine executor. Again, this is not Spark executor, but Informatica interface to the uh, Informatica is a Spark interface to the uh, cluster. So we give we pass on the packaged uh, jar to uh, a Spark in, uh, executor engine which in turn contacts a uh, resource manager uh, and do a Spark submit. Uh, in, addition to do, uh, the, in, in addition to the Spark submit, it also does uh, ask for the resource, uh, resource request to run that application. Um, so once, uh, once Spark engine do a Spark submit, resource manager then contacts individual load manager of individual Hadoop data nodes and find out the available resources on the nodes where uh, the containers can be started. I think I moved. Uh, but I think I kind of my screen is freezing. Uh, Okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. So once resource manager uh, finds out which are the node managers that has the resource availability, we start the containers and uh, Spark driver gets, so the container where uh, the first container that starts is a driver container. And then the subsequent containers are the executed container, right? So, uh, and once the executor starts, the job gets submitted and uh, it start it, it, it and, and and the job continues. Now, once the Spark uh, executor does its task and then it kind of completes the application, it gives the report back to the driver, Spark driver, which in turn gives status back to the resource manager, saying that I am done. And this and the resource manager updates the same into the Informatica domain, and that's when we see that the mapping uh, status in the Informatica monitoring tab has been complete or failed or uh, cancelled uh, any status. So uh, on high level, the stage one is mapping translation. Uh, stage two is 
Spark engine does the Spark submit and negotiate for the resources, ask for the resources to run the application. Third stage is Yarn contacts the node manager, find out which node has a resource available to start those containers. And then uh, fourth stage is where the actual, your, once the driver and computer are spawned, your job is actually uh, uh, starts running on the cluster. So uh, until this point, right, we, ha we have a mapping which got converted into a Spark equivalent Scala code, got submitted to the cluster, right? And then the job is running and then job completed. And then now we have a flow where one, based on the failed or success, it reports back to the Informatica domain, right? So, so, so far so good, we have a mapping running in Spark engine. Next thing that comes in the mind is, okay, how does the resources being, uh, you know, uh, optimized or allocated or relocated on the cluster? Uh, how do we, kind of uh, optimize or performance uh, efficient uh, or resource efficient, uh, we, we, how do we handle that in the cluster side? So the, right. So next slide is where uh, I'm going to talk about the resource allocation. Uh, in Spark, uh, we have two types of resource allocation. One is static allocation and the other is one is dynamic allocation. Um, uh, in static allocation, if you see here on the left hand side here, uh, there's a graph. If you see here, um, memory or core versus time. So let's say, so the main difference is in the static mode, uh, whatever the resources being asked by an application at the beginning of this stage, you allocate that resources. And whether the process or the application need that much during the entire life cycle of the application, no matter what, the resources are hogged. So the resources are constant. So if you see here, let's say an example I take in the beginning of uh, a compute, in the beginning of an application, there is more like a compute intensive a job, right? So then you ask X amount of viewers from the cluster. Now, during the life cycle of the application, let's say, uh, after uh, a certain stage, there is not much of resource intensive, but more of a disk operation or let's say you're doing a read write or some kind of where not much of resource intensive work is there. So then you could see that uh, actually the application don't need that much uh, resources, but still we are hogging into that resources because it's a static way of allocating the resources. So it cannot kind of, it's not kind of aligned with the workload. However, in the dynamic uh, scenario, uh, same example, Right, same example. We uh, the Spark. Uh, if we have this dynamic option enabled, what it does is based on the workload. If you see, initially we had like high computation, so it allocated a lot of uh, executors. But as the workload, uh, the resource uh, intensive work came down, you can see that the executors got released, and thus the resources got uh, given back to the yarn for other applications. So and and then again. Uh, later stage when the need for let's say another high computation work or job uh, uh, came along, the, you could see that dynamically it kind of asked uh, the yarn was able to allocate the uh, executors and then it was able to kind of align with the workload. So uh, so now you can see very obvious like you don't want to be uh, when this uh, you most of the scenarios it will be a dynamic allocation why because. Uh, that's the more optimized way of using the resources. Static way, it kind of hogs on the resources in the life cycle of application, dynamically kind of flow, it, the flow goes based on the workload. So that being said, uh, most of the scenarios, you will have an Informatica recommends you to enable the dynamics uh, allocation uh, to run uh, Informatica jobs. Uh, Again, a little bit talking more uh, about the same dynamic allocation um, feature. So here's a, here is an example. Let's say an application master, right? Application master um, starts a two of the executors uh, for an application. But let's say uh, the job is uh, being, uh, uh, something is some operation is being done by the executor one while executor two is in idle state. So if it finds that the, an executor has been idle, not doing much beyond a certain time or uh, limit, then it kinds of, um, you know, uh, releases that executor, uh, removes that executor, and then the resources get back to the yarn. Whereas in certain scenarios, uh, in the later case, if there is a more need for an executor, more resource intensive work is being done, then, uh, you know, application master will spawn a new executors. So, um, 
So you can see that uh, the dynamic allocation is very important. Um, this is another feature uh, that Spark has that goes in tandem with dynamic Spark allocation, uh, dynamic resource allocation, and that is Spark Success Service. Uh, the, so the dynamic resource allocation and Success Service, they go both hand in hand. Uh, I'll explain in why, but let me talk about what a Spark Success Service is, right? So a Spark Success Service uh, is kind of a proxy service uh, which um, help uh, to which which kind of which helps uh, the Spark application uh, in two ways. Number one, reliability. Uh, what I mean by that, in in this example, if you see here, let's say we have an executor one running on let's say node one, or it, actually these executors can be on a multiple executors can be on the same node or it can be across the node. So let's say the executor one. Wrote, wrote some um, data files on the disk, right? So it wrote some data disk, uh, files on the data disk. And executor two needs to access the same file. Um, if, let's say the, the uh, Spark Suffer service is not there, in such scenarios, what will happen? Uh, as long as the life of executor one is there, this file exists, the local file exists. Um, so if, executor one is alive and executor two needs to access that file, he will be able to access it because the file is there. But let's say some uh, issues because of out of memory error or whatever, right? The executor one uh, got killed. Uh, if we don't have the Spark uh, Suffer service, the local files are also gone. So now you don't have a, uh, um, the executor two, if need to access the same file, it has to regenerate the same file. It, it doesn't have access to the same file again. Um, so that's where the reliability comes. So if so, with this external Spark Suffer service, what happens is uh, uh, executor one will write the files uh, locally into the disk, and now if executor two needs to access the same file, the request would go through the external uh, Spark Suffer service. External Suffer service will know the location of the uh, disk where executor one wrote the, wrote the file. So now since the external uh, Suffer service knows the location of the disk where executor one wrote the file. So no matter even if executor one goes uh, or get killed, uh, still executor two will be able to access it, uh, uh, the files from the disk. So if you see here, it serves Suffer data to requesting executors. So no matter, uh, so th that's where the reliability is. Uh, even if one executor or um, the parent executor is gone, it will be able to, um, uh, the other executor will still be able to access the data file and move on with the uh, execution. Um, it caches the suffer data independent of executor, as I said. Um, next thing is, other than the reliability, uh, there is a scalability, right? Uh, why scalability? Because, um, as I said, right, the, the Spark dynamic allocation goes in hand in hand with the suffer service. So now, uh, if you don't have the dynamic allocation, then kind of we are not uh, leveraging the, you, your application can't scale based on the workload, right? So uh, with Spark dynamic allocation, to enable the uh, Spark dynamic allocation, you need to have a Spark service also configured so that your load can scale and then executors are not independent, I mean, they are independent and then not so much tied with the life cycle of one specific executor. So, um, uh, broadly speaking, so you need to have all your mapping, most of the scenarios to be enabled for uh, dynamic, uh, uh, source of dynamic allocation. And second thing, next is to set up a configuration for a Spark service, a Spark Suffer service. So how do you enable uh, Spark Suffer service? So there are a few parameters that needs to be enabled in the yarn site XML. Um, so uh, the Spark Software Service is an auxiliary service, so we need to set a yarn dot node manager dot auxiliary service property in the yarn site XML, and then we need to see what is the class that does uh, all of this work, which is yarn Software service, and then we need to add the uh, Spark Software jar in the class path, yarn class path. Uh, so with this property being set, uh, your application is actually uh, so these properties need to be set on the cluster side. So as long as we have this set your um, mapping when you run, by default, it will run for dynamic allocation with the Spark Suffer service. So 
I hope I made my point here. Uh, and here's the KB link, uh, which uh, have more details on uh, the same, how to set these properties on the cluster side. All right, so that was a quick overview on uh, the integration of BDM with Spark uh, or how it actually works behind the scene. But moving on, uh, let's talk about uh, the journey from uh, high blaze to Spark. So uh, in the initial stage, in, in the initial phase, right, when Informatica started the BDM product, uh, we used to have uh, uh, Hive uh, as the only engine at that point in time because Hive was the best in class engine available at the point in time in the market, which worked on MapReduce framework. And that was year 2012, around the time frame uh, where Informatica came up with the BDM product and we had the Hive engine working in a uh, MapReduce framework and uh, you know, um, we started with that. But as uh, different uh, engines came in play where like Hot Nose came up with the Tage engine, which is uh, faster than MapReduce because it does um, uh, in-memory processing and so on. Uh, we started supporting that in around 2014 timeframe. And, um, and, and in addition to that, while Hive engine was still being supported, Informatica invested on um, uh, and running its own proprietary PMDTM engine on the Hadoop cluster. Uh, and which we named as an Blaze engine. And the Blaze engine actually really um, um, stand out uh, way ahead when we compare with the performance uh, in, comparing, in comparison to the Hive engine. Uh, when we did a comparison, the Blaze was way ahead in the uh, performance metric uh, when it came to the performance uh, compared to Hive engine. Now, why most of the reason, I mean, one of the main reasons that I could recall is because in Hive Engine, uh, a lot of the Informatica transform transformations we used to translate using UDFs, and that's an overhead um, uh, to, um, for all of this. So, but then PMGTM, it was not the case, so we saw a significant performance uh, gain in the Blaze Engine. So that was around 2016 uh, timeframe when Blaze Engine came. Um, but as, uh, the Hadoop ecosystem and different uh, uh, engines were being, uh, you know, evolving. Spark was uh, came out as an uh, uh, outstanding uh, engine, which was widely accepted within the industry. And looking the value in it, Informatica invested also heavily invested on Spark uh, engine, and we started supporting Spark engine as well, starting uh, 2016 Q2. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, the Informatica BDM has been. Uh, uh, in alignment with every release of the Spark, uh, as we, as we, as we, as we, uh, as, as we uh, uh, um, came up with the different releases, you can see that uh, Spark has uh, we, the BDM. We have been in alignment with the, every Spark uh, releases, and as of 2019, uh, we are supporting. Uh, as, as of as of 2019, uh, we could see that. Um, we uh, released 10 to 2, in which we support uh, Spark 2.3 structured streaming and Spark Databricks. Okay, so this is a quick um, uh, differences on how each of these engine works. Um, uh, Hive uh, works on a Hive QL. Uh, it uses the Hive uh, SQL queries to execute the you know your uh, mapping, whereas uh, Blaze uses its own native DTM engine, and Spark uses Scala code. On the processing side, the Blaze and Hive supports a batch processing, like your mapping uh, is, a, if it, uh, is, a, is a batch mapping. Uh, ba Blaze and uh, Hive support that, whereas Spark, both ba batch as well as real-time uh, streaming mapping we support. So um, you see a big advantage on the Spark here that uh, you could, if you have a sources like Kafka or you know, JMS or Kinesis and so on, uh, Spark is the engine to go. When it comes to the, I talked about what Suffle is and why it's expensive and so on. So uh, the Hive, in Hive engine, it's a disk-based Suffle, whereas in Blaze and Spark, you could say it's the in-memory as well as disk-based Suffle, which is faster and efficient. Uh, performance is better in Blaze compared to Hive. And so uh, Spark and Blaze, they kind of do, 
and neck to neck, so the performance are pretty comparable uh, between these, both these engines. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are uh, uh, key uh, enhancements or key supportability that are uh, key functionality that we put that way, right? Key functionality that we have in the Spark, uh, which is not there in uh, either of this uh, Blaze or Hive engine, and which kind of uh, the push point for why uh, the Spark should be your choice uh, um, to run your uh, engine, uh, to run your mapping with NVIDIA. Um, so Spark supports edge type supports, which means if you have a uh, mapping with uh, array struct or map kind of uh, data types, uh, Spark supports out of the box. Uh, you could use the same thing in Blaze, but then you have to do some uh, extra uh, data processor, and then you have to kind of uh, do some hand coding. Spark supports this edge uh, type data types out of the box. Uh, it also supports complex files. Uh, suppose if we have, uh, let's say we have a source file uh, with Avro, JSON, or Parquet, uh, ORC format, uh, Spark support that out of the box um, as a complex file object. And no, it, not just only for the reader side, but it can uh, write output files in, in, in these formats. So um, Spark supports the complex file for, uh, format uh, for all of these files. Uh, next, very important, uh, I think this functionality came up with the Spark, and we started supporting this, which is called the window transformation. Uh, window transformation, basically, uh, if I have to say that, it's like uh, you are doing a computation on a range of rows. So um, it's kind of a frame. So for every input record, we will return a value. Uh, value will be based on the previous frame. So it will be a group, it will be a set of rows, incoming rows. So uh, uh, you kind of, so if you have to let's say, calculate the moving average for a set of rows, you'll use a window transformation. This functionality is supported only with the Spark engine and would, is widely used in uh, uh, streaming uh, world. Next is a Python transformation for data science use cases, which is again is supported with uh, 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 Spark engine. Um, and Next is the uh, uh, clear integrated uh, intelligence uh, structure discovery. Uh, this is uh, this is a very um, uh, innovative uh, tech, I mean uh, uh, innovative thing that is uh, there with the Spark engine. As in, you could actually uh, uh, get any structured, unstructured, or any kind of data load into an, our uh, informatica intelligent discovery um, model uh, and then you can generate the model out of that so behind the scene basically it uses a machine algorithm uh, machine learning algorithm and then it parses the data and no matter whether your file is a structure or semi structure or unstructured it can load all of that parts and then it can show you a model and then you can kind of uh, you know um, um, uh, massage that you can remove i mean you can uh, kind of uh, 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 optimize those model based on your organization or what you need, and then you can export that model out of it and you can use in BDM as is. Uh, so this is a very key uh, innovation, uh, if I have to say, for the Spark engine. Basically, it's like behind the scenes uses machine learning algorithm and useful for any type of, any format of source, I mean, you know, the uh, format of file, be it a structure, unstructured, or semi structured file, any kind of that. So, um, yeah, so I think we, uh, I, I think I stressed enough that, that, okay, why Spark is important. And uh, in addition to that, any even going forward, any uh, new feature innovation is going to mostly, uh, it, it's, going, it's going to be focused on a Spark engine. So with that being said, there will be definitely some uh, existing mappings that we might have, which is still using Hive engine. And how do we move those Hive engine to uh, use Spark without any changes or much changes to the your existing mappings. So that's what my next slide uh, is about. Um, how do we migrate our mappings, which are currently in a Hive engine, into uh, Spark or Blaze engine? Um, first thing, starting 10 to 2, there is no more Hive engine option available in the developer client. So you will not see any option as Hive engine or Hive engine deprecated or whatsoever. Uh, next is um, there are a set of infra CMD commands that we uh, got to execute, uh, which will basically uh, convert or migrate uh, the Hive engine into Spark or Blaze, depending upon what option we choose here. So the first option is list mapping engines. This will give us a list of the mapping which have 
hive as an engine currently. Next is enable mapping validation environment. Uh, this will update those mappings into hive or blaze, whatever we pass in here. The third command is disable the mapping validation environment. So third stage is to once now as a second step, we already have set the engine to spark or blaze. Third stage is to go and disable the uh, selected hive engine from the uh, existing mappings. So these are infra CMD commands. Um, if you uh, see here, there are two types of options here, MRS slash DIS, uh, we call it as a plugin. Uh, when we execute this, uh, these commands, uh, be cognizant that uh, you use MRS for the scenarios which are the mappings which are not yet deployed to the DIS, but kind of an ad hoc mapping you have which you run from the developer client. So to update those mappings, you use MRS as a flag, whereas uh, to update any of your deployed mapping, uh, you use DIS as a flag. And uh, we have an, a link here that again talks about in detail uh, what are the different parameters to be passed in and uh, whether you want to do it at the project level, you want to do it at the you know, repository level, how to do that. We have a KB link that have uh, more details on that. Okay, uh, let's take a quick look on the upgrade paths. Um, on the left hand side, if you see here, all of, all of the, our major GA releases uh, has a direct upgrade path to 10.2.2 HF1. 10.2.2 HF1 uh, is the latest and greatest as of, uh, it came out a week back. Uh, and uh, we have a direct upgrade path from all the previous, uh, if you see here, all the previous uh, major versions, there's a direct path to 10.2.2 HF1, except 10.2.0. If you are on 10.2.0, you need to be on 10.2.0 HF1 before it can be directly upgraded to 10.2.2 HF1. So just please be uh, informed about it. Okay, uh, next here, uh, if you see in my right hand slide here, um, as I was saying, there's no more Hive engine uh, option uh, being uh, showing up in the your developer clients. You do not see any Hive engine or Hive engine deprecated option anymore starting 10.2.2. Okay, when it comes to selecting the engine, what engine you should run your mapping in, I think as Informatica, we recommend uh, to select the checkbox next to Hadoop and let, and if you, once you, I mean, with, when, when you select this checkbox, both the Spark and Blaze engines are uh, get uh, selected by default. And we ask customer not to change it because uh, you could go and, and, and uh, change it and run on a specific engine, but the best would be to let uh, Informatica Spark executor, a smart executor, uh, decide which engine is based for that specific given mapping based on the internal, uh, based on the uh, you know the translation and the logic that it internally calculates. Let the Spark uh, smart executor decide which engine is best for the given mapping and then run the mapping in that engine instead of we going specifically choose one engine over other. Um, Next, very important uh, uh, to be informed of is if you have a relational objects like uh, uh, you know any 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 uh, thing from Oracle DB2 SQL Server or any kind of those relational objects, and you are using a native connector to uh, and you have been using native connection so far uh, to run those uh, mappings in let's say in Hive engine, uh, those objects need to be uh, converted into a object which is basically as a JDBC connection. So if you are, you, if you have a source and a target uh, important as a native connection, with a native connection, those needs to be re-imported with JDBC scope connection for it to be run in a uh, Spark engine. And uh, we recommend uh, you to do this prior to the upgrade. Uh, that way, once the upgrade is done, you're, you're all set to run the mapping. Then later on, do an upgrade and find out, oh, is this an upgrade issue or something else. So uh, very important, be uh, informed of this. If you have any relational sources in your mapping, convert them to a JDBC, uh, re-import re those objects as a JDBC connection type uh, so that once you're doing an upgrade, you can run them, uh, that mapping seamlessly in the Spark engine. All right, so that was uh, uh, about a journey from uh, high blaze to Spark. Now, let me um, uh, uh, invite my colleague uh, Pippin here and and, and take over the rest of the presentation. So. Uh, thanks, Ramesh. Uh, so continuing on the journey, uh, we are talking about uh, 
on the troubleshooting aspects of uh, uh, the spark mappings. So uh, with respect to troubleshooting on the spark mappings, uh, it, it, it is uh, similar, uh, it, it's similar to more uh, about like uh, we are running the mapping in spark and then uh, you have a spark application also started. So uh, we'll be talking about from the Informatica side and also from the spark application side on what all details to collect and how can we troubleshoot on both ends. Right? So uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, the logs that we need to collect for uh, any kind of issue uh, that you see on uh, a Spark failure uh, would be kind of uh, the mapping log. And uh, from the mapping log, it would, there'll be a Spark application that would be launched uh, on the cluster. Uh, so we would require the Spark application log as well. Right? So these two details are the main uh, uh, ones that we would require. Uh, apart from that, uh, there are details, of, I mean, the level of logging uh, also uh, differs based on uh, the override tracing that you set uh, for your mapping. So uh, in the developer client, uh, you have something called as run configurations where uh, you can set a particular uh, override tracing for your mapping. Uh, right here, if you see, uh, you have different kind of override tracing levels. Uh, starting from none all the way to verbose data where uh, the verbosity increases um, uh, in that order. Um, so the normal uh, is the mode where you will get an info kind of uh, tracing level uh, in your mapping log as well as in your Spark application log. Right? So uh, the one that we would recommend for debugging uh, would uh, would be verbose init. Uh, though verbose init and verbose data gives the same uh, debug level kind of info, Verbose data gives the actual data as well, which we don't require uh, for most of the cases. So uh, Verbose finance is the way to go for uh, kind of having the debug messages in your mapping and your Spark application log, right? So uh, these uh, debug messages in the uh, mapping log would actually let us know, okay, what are the interactions that are going on uh, with the DIS uh, or with the resource manager UI, uh, with the resource manager to get the Spark application started and once the Spark application is started, the verbose messages in that Spark application log would help us to isolate, uh, okay, what are the calls that are going on to uh, to Spark SQL, to Hive, uh, and so on, right? So uh, the verbose select mode is the recommended way for any kind of uh, uh, debugging that we can do uh, uh, with, with respect to the logging. Right, so uh, the next one that we'll be talking about would be the, uh, uh, yeah, so the, uh, application URL uh, what, uh, for the corresponding Spark application, you can get it from the mapping log or you can actually get it from uh, the uh, monitoring UI. I mean, I'm sure you'll be aware of the admin console monitoring. Uh, from the mapping, uh, if you expand it, you would have the thing for Spark 0, uh, which would have the monitoring URL. Right? So uh, you click on this monitoring URL and it will take you a page, uh, something like this where uh, you you can see if so this this page would come if you have the spark history server uh, enabled right so uh, the spark history server has to be enabled on the uh, on the cluster uh, once it is enabled the uh, the application can be seen after it is completed uh, because you can see that the mapping is completed uh, when you click on the link it would show you the history of the completed application if this is not integrated uh, with the cluster spark history server you would not be able to see this UI uh, over there. Right? So uh, it is it is uh, necessary here to integrate the BDM with uh, the cluster Spark history server. Right? So uh, the below link right here uh, actually tells you about uh, how to integrate uh, the BDM with the cluster Spark history server uh, that details all the steps. So uh, yeah, uh, moving on. Okay, so on, on the Spark history server, once you click on the link, you would see this particular page here. Uh, on the executors tab right here, you could see what are what where is the driver running, on which uh, address, on which node is it running, and what is the uh, where are the number of executors running? Uh, there can be one or there can be many based on the based on the job. Uh, where are they running? Uh, what are the what is the storage that they use? What are the uh, so there are a lot of statistics right here. How many reads that they did? What was the input for the executors and so on? You could see all of this from the Spark History Server UI. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is really helpful for us to understand uh, on what happened on uh, the particular job, right? All right. So, uh, yeah, furthermore, uh, in case of uh, like a long running job or a hanging job, 
right? Uh, once you see that the mapping is kind of uh, running for a long time, uh, what we can do is we can click the same link, uh, the link that you see uh, at the mapping. And uh, in this Spark UI page, uh, you, in the executor tab, you would see that one of the other comp uh, components, like say the drivers or the executors uh, would be in running state. And you would see a thread dump uh, column right here. You would not see this in completed applications because uh, the, the processes have kind of completed. So there's nothing running on which we can take a, a thread dump. But for a running driver or executor, there'll be an option here to take a thread dump. Uh, once you click on it, uh, you would see a page like this, uh, which would uh, list out the threads of the particular uh, process. Uh, in this case, it's a driver. So uh, once you click on it, it would list out all the uh, driver functions or all the driver uh, threads uh, that were running at that time, uh, which would help us to find out, okay, on which function is it actually stuck or what is it doing currently, uh, which is causing uh, this particular delay, right? So uh, that, that helps in troubleshooting. So the Spark UI, uh, the Spark history server is kind of a mandatory thing to kind of uh, configure, uh, which helps in uh, troubleshooting all of this. If it is not configured, we will not have all the statistics to actually say uh, what, what, is going, what is going on. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, apart from that, if you could see there were multiple tab, uh, tabs over here on the uh, history UI, right? So we only talked about executors. There are multiple tabs. Uh, uh, one, one of them is the stages. Uh, the stages tab uh, right here. The stages tab it gives out the stages that the uh, particular Spark application is going through. So uh, these are nothing but the Spark operations uh, like map, reduce, filter, um, collect. Uh, all these operations those, those will be kind of listed here. Uh, so from this we can kind of understand what the particular uh, uh, how the uh, code generation has happened and what is actually happening on uh, the or the Spark side. So for an example, if your mapping has a joiner. Uh, we should be seeing kind of a join function over here where uh, it is actually doing a join between maybe two tables, uh, two hive tables, for example, and then uh, uh, and then see it out, right? So you can see the details, uh, granular level details of each of these stages as well. Uh, there can be more than one stage uh, as well. It, here, there's only one stage shown, but you can have more than one. So uh, you can have multiple stages uh, and then the tag, apart from the tag visualization like this, uh, it also shows the uh, metrics by executor uh, saying that, okay, uh, this particular application had spawned around 10 um, executors. And uh, these are the nodes where it ran. Uh, these are the individual logs, uh, log links for each of these executors, right? Uh, it also shows us what is the input size taken, uh, or did, did, did some of them fail and so on. It also lists the total number of tasks done by each of the uh, executor. Uh, right? So, it, and there's also a cumulative amount of uh, tasks uh, for all these uh, attempts that, that can also be seen uh, for, uh, for the particular uh, run, right? So that's also there in the stages step. Um, Apart from that, we have uh, the environment tab, which lists the uh, JVM flags and also the Spark related properties uh, like Spark is due to memory, driver memory uh, to start with. Apart from that, there are a lot of other properties that Spark uses for its environment, uh, which you can see right here. Uh, so another key point uh, to kind of note here is that uh, the Spark event logging uh, would actually help us to understand what all happened uh, with a particular uh, execution right, of a Spark job. Now, uh, if you have to share the uh, kind of DAG information over from the UI to us, it would be kind of troublesome. So in which case, what you can do is uh, you can pass on the Spark event log uh, directory uh, to a location where the Spark history server is kind of listening. Right? So uh, it should be set to the same location where the Spark history server is uh, keeping its HTTPS files. Uh, once that is kept, uh, you can see this uh, UI uh, from the Prometic application as well. Now in this directory for every application, there'll be an event file like this. Uh, I mean, I just pasted a snippet of it, the first uh, two lines or three lines. Uh, and then 
you can see uh, the uh, attempt ID, you can see the stage ID, you can see what number of partitions it used, did it use disk and so on. It will be similar to the DAG uh, that it creates. It will be similar to this particular information right here. Uh, it would, uh, if, we, if we get this file, uh, we can see the same stage or the same visualization uh, what you see in your UI uh, over at our end as well, right? So that uh, definitely helps in isolating uh, many uh, performance issues uh, to see, okay, is the DAG correct? Is it using the right Spark operation or not? Is it using uh, the right, uh, I mean, uh, uh, can, can the operations be optimized or not? All this kind of helps, the DAG actually helps us to understand what is going on with the uh, Spark application and uh, whether it can be uh, kind of enhanced or uh, can be optimized or not. Uh, yeah, so moving on, we have like a couple of other debugging flags as well. Uh, the first one being uh, debug Spark Summit. Now, uh, as Ramesh was mentioning, uh, we from the DIS side, we have the LDTM thread, which actually does the Spark Summit, uh, submitting the uh, job to the cluster. So the debug Spark Summit would list out the arguments that we uh, pass on to the Spark Summit utility. utility. So it gives like a verbose logging uh, during the Spark Summit. Uh, the screenshot here, if you can see it, uh, it shows what is the uh, executor memory, what is the uh, uh, driver memory, uh, what are the number of cores used, what is the deploy mode, and so on. Right. So uh, all of this is actually uh, helpful in understanding what were the arguments used when we are doing a Spark Summit, what are the properties, what were the uh, memory, or what were the configuration parameters that were passed during uh, the Spark Summit. Right, so uh, this property has to be set as a DIS. Uh, it's a DIS custom property. Uh, we set this to the value true, and then uh, yeah, we have to recycle the DS, and then uh, we start seeing all this. But this is, these are just for debugging purposes. If there is an issue with the Spark Summit of actually submitting it to the cluster, uh, we would uh, this logging would definitely help. Uh, apart from that, we have the debug Spark push on property. Uh, this property retains the uh, uh, configuration file the application jar, uh, which we used during Spark Summit. So uh, one of the snippets for the configuration files, I have it right here. Uh, if you can see in the DIS temp uh, of your Informatica uh, in installation, uh, we'll have the site XML and we'll also have the runtime conf, the Spark runtime conf. Apart from this, we'll also have the uh, class file, uh, the class file which is actually, uh, will be packaged as a jar file and then as given over to uh, the cluster for the for Spark execution. Yep. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Apart from this, uh, we have the uh, extra Java options. Now, this is this is uh, the Hadoop connection right here. Uh, the Hadoop connection, uh, uh, as you can see in the Spark tab, uh, you will have these advanced properties. Now, in this advanced properties. Uh, you can see the driver extra Java options and the uh, executor extra Java options, uh, where you can put the JVM level, level flags, uh, uh, the flags for uh, debugging something, maybe uh, the Sun debug for uh, the Kerberos debug flags or the uh, networking uh, JVM flags for uh, network uh, tracking and so on. So, so based on the uh, so based on the particular uh, option, uh, the verbose of the verbose class, like say in this we are using the verbose class option. Uh, as you can see in the Spark application log, uh, we have all the classes loaded because of this particular option. The verbose class is nothing but it just lists out the uh, uh, the classes that are used by uh, a JVM, right? So uh, this is just an example. We can have uh, other than these uh, certain flags uh, which can help isolating a particular kind of issue, be it network, uh, Kerberos related. Uh, in this case, maybe a class not found exception uh, or something. Uh, all of these can actually help in, uh, uh, I mean, in debugging a particular driver or an executor at the Spark at the Spark site. Okay. So uh, apart from this, we have the enhancements in uh, monitoring. So we have the uh, 10 to 2 uh, release uh, in which the Spark monitoring was enabled out of the box, uh, uh, out of the box by default. So uh, in 10 to 1 uh, and prior versions. The Spark monitoring has to be enabled using custom properties, but uh, and there was kind of a little performance overhead because of these prop, uh, Spark monitoring properties in 10 to 1 and, uh, and prior. But in 10 to 2, 
this path monitor is enabled by default and then uh, the performance has been uh, kind of enhanced there are uh, we are using like data frame tags uh, and instead of the accumulator in the end right so because of this particular uh, uh, inclusion of using tags uh, th these are the same tags that you could see in the event uh, log that i was showing earlier uh, those tags are the same uh, we use those tags for uh, showing the display out here how many rows were read how many rows were written and so on right so uh, in, in the ui right here you can see different kinds of statistics summary detailed uh, historical statistics you can see what how, i mean uh, how many number of rows were written what was the average rows elapsed time so on uh, so all this is available from the spark monitoring okay so uh, we uh, uh, here we are talking about the, uh, the releases that came this year uh, 2019 we started the uh, year uh, with uh, 10 to 1 sp1 release uh, we came to the major uh, release of 10 to 2 in around march um, and this was kind of a uh, this was a uh, a, a next version release right so there were a lot many features that came in 10 to 2 uh, and then we released the sp1 on end of april and uh, we have the 10 to 2 hf1 that came in uh, last week so this is our re latest release that we have in the 10 to 2 cycle yeah and we have uh, uh, the service packs planned on top of the versions every two months so we have uh, something like 10 to 2 hf1 sp1 planned for around September, uh, SP2 uh, planned around October. And uh, yeah, so these are for the 10 to 2 cycle. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we have a major release again coming up uh, in 10.4. Uh, it is around end of this year. Uh, and then this will have a lot more features uh, with respect to Spark uh, with uh, uh, many enhancements and more support on, uh, on Spark. Right, so uh, this is kind of the uh, the release cadence that we have for this year. Uh, yeah, we are looking forward to uh, having you on board for uh, Spark. Uh, we'll have our Informatica support standing by for uh, any of your issues that you face uh, in your project in your implementation. Um, right, so yeah, so that that's all that we had uh, as part of the presentation. Here are a couple of uh, reference few references that we have. Uh, these are references to the uh, the product availability matrix of 10 to 2 HF1. We have the um, release notes and the big data primer for anyone starting new. We have something like the performance tuning guide here, uh, which would be helpful in uh, kind of tuning your environment according to your uh, uh, to your enterprise uh, uh, resources, and also uh, I mean any other any other uh, uh, any other tuning tips that that we have, right? So. Uh, this is all we had. Uh, this is uh, what we had with respect to our presentation. If there are uh, any other questions, I think we'll take it off from uh, our chat window. So, uh, okay. So I think most of the questions are kind of answered here. Um, so, so Bupin and uh, Ramesh, uh, thank you very much for your time and presentation. I think one thing I wanted to just uh, reiterate is that this webinar is being re recorded uh, uh, a link to the recording will be, you know, sent out to all the registered participants, and a copy of the slide deck will also be shared with you guys. Uh, I know if a lot of you might be thinking, uh, how do you get access to all those uh, reference documents uh, that have, that were mentioned uh, in the slide? So a copy of the slides will also be sent out to you guys. So I think uh, that will be helpful. But yeah, uh, with that, I'll uh, pass it on to the Q and A. All right. Uh, thanks, Patu. Uh, so yeah, I could see uh, most of the uh, questions here. Um, right. So uh, one of the questions that I see from uh, Rohan is when upgrade happens, we have to move all the mappings from uh, Hive mode to Spark mode. Uh, so yeah, it is recommended to uh, kind of move the mappings if you are running in push on mode uh, to move from Hive mode to Spark mode because the Hive mode is going to be de is deprecated. Uh, so you would not see a Hive uh, option in uh, version 10 to 2 and on right so uh, you would have to use those steps which uh, Ramesh mentioned in one of the slides to uh, to move migrate your mappings from hive mode to spark mode okay and uh, uh, so okay let me see 
I think, yeah, so there was a question about supporting HTTP 3.0 for which uh, there is a KB, which as mentioned uh, needs to be kind of followed for uh, for HTTP 2.3 support, HTTP uh, 3.0 support. Uh, right. So uh, for, okay, EMR 5.23 uh, support available with any of the recent version of BDM. Uh, I, I think we should have to refer to PAM for this, but um, yeah. So uh, we would have to refer to PAM for any of the latest releases for this. Uh, that is something to be looked upon. Um, yeah, I think, okay. So uh, for NoSQL targets like Cassandra, uh, also Spark executors will work. So uh, for NoSQL targets, we support NoSQL targets, uh, something like HBase, uh, but Cassandra does not, is not supported with, uh, uh, with uh, how to push on mode. So uh, there's no uh, smart executor in question itself. So uh, we have other NoSQL databases which we support, uh, like HBase. So we'll work with that. Right. So uh, we, will we be supporting an Impala connection? Um, so uh, there is support that is coming up for Impala uh, in 10.4 uh, with Spark. So uh, that is something that is to be looked upon. Uh, in the later releases, uh, that is end of this year, we are we are kind of looking for supporting the Impala connection. Okay, is S3 supported in BDM as source and target? Yes, definitely it is supported uh, as source and target. Uh, we have that in all of our versions, starting 10.1, I believe. So, uh, yeah, also Redshift is supported. S3 lookup is also supported uh, as part of the questions. Uh, Okay, so uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think Patu, uh, we are good with the questions with all that is all, all that we see. Uh, all of them, uh, most of them seems to have been answered, but all we have missed. Uh, we apologize for that, but I think we are we are more or less uh, kind of done with the questions here. Fantastic, uh, Vipin and uh, Ramesh, thank you so much for your time and. Uh, you know, walking our customers through the complete technical information, really appreciate. And uh, thanks, uh, thank you to all the registered participants and the attendees who joined us today for this uh, webinar, and also the panelists who helped us answering the, all those uh, questions that came in. Uh, we will uh, be sending out the link for the recording and the slide decks later, uh, later in the week. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Kato. Thank you. Thank you.